as the forces of the Blacks closed in around that of the Greens. The Greens found themselves attacked by the Blacks from three sides. The Westermen were driven back, foot by foot, into the water of the God's Eye. Hundreds died there, cut down whilst fighting in the reeds. Hundreds more drowned as they tried to flee. By nightfall, 2,000 men were dead, among them many noble lords, including Lord Frey, Lord Lefford, Lord Biggleston, Lord Charlton, Lord Swift, Lord Rain, Sir Clarence Crackhall, Sir Emory Hill, the bastard of Lannisport. The Lannister hosts were shattered and slaughtered, but at such cost that young Ben Blackwood, the boy Lord of Raventree, wept when he saw the heaps dead. The most grievous losses were suffered by the Northmen, for the Winter Wolves had begged the honour of leading the attack, and had charged five times into the ranks of Lannister spearmen. More than two-thirds of the men who had ridden south with Lord Dustin were dead or wounded. Fighting continued elsewhere in the realm as well, though, though these clashes were smaller than the massacre by the God's Eye. In the Reach, Lord Hightower and his ward, Prince Dare on the Daring, continued to win victories, enforcing the submission of the Rowans of Golden Grove the Oak Hearts of Old Oak, and the Lords of the Shield Islands. Lord Boris Baratheon called his banners and assembled near 6,000 men at Storm's End, with the avowed intent of marching on King's Landing, only then to lead them south into the mountains instead. Lord Boris used the pretext of Dornish incursions into the Stormlands to justify this, but many and more were heard to whisper that it was the dragons ahead, not the Dornishmen behind, that prompted his change of heart. Out in the Sunset Sea, the longships of the Red Kraken fell upon Fair Isle, sweeping from one end of the island to the other, whilst Lord Farman sheltered behind his walls, sending out pleas for help that would never come. Back at Tarrenhall, however, Aemond Targaryen and Kristen Cole debated how best to answer Queen Rhaenyra's attacks. Though Black Harren's seat was too strong to be taken by force, and the Riverlords dare not lay siege for fear of Vagar, the king's men were running short of food and fodder, and losing men and horses to hunger and sickness. Only blackened fields and burned villages remained within sight of the castle's massive walls, and those foraging parties that ventured farther did not return. So Kristen urged a withdrawal to the south, where Aegon's support was strongest, but the prince refused, saying only cravens run from traitors. The loss of King's Landing and the Iron Throne had enraged him, and when word of the fish feed reached Tarrenhall, the Lord Protector had almost strangled the poor squire who had delivered him the news. Only the intervention of his bedmate, Alice Rivers, had saved the boy's life. Prince Aemond favoured an immediate attack upon King's Landing. None of the Queen's dragons were a match for Vagar, he insisted. But Sir Kristen Cole called that a folly. One against six is a fight for a fool, my prince, he declared. Let them march south he urged once more, and join their strength to Lord Hightower's, and Prince Aemon could reunite with his brother, Darren, and his dragon. King Aegon had escaped Rhaenyra's grasp as well. This they knew. Surely he'd reclaim some fire, and join his brothers, and perhaps their friends inside the city might find a way to free Queen Helena as well, so she could bring Dreamfire to the battle. Four dragons could perhaps prevail against six, if one was Vagar. Prince Aemon refused to consider this craven course. As regent for his brother, he might have commanded the hand's obedience. Yet, he did not. Munkin speculates that this was because of his respect for the older man. Whilst the full mushroom suggests that the two men had become rivals for the affections of the wet nurse Alice Rivers, who had used love potions on the both to inflame their passions. Septon Eustace echoes the dwarf in part, but says it was Aemond alone who had become bestotted with the Rivers woman, to such an extent that he could not bear the thought of leaving her and Harrenhal. Whatever the reason, Sir Kristen Cole and Prince Aemon decided to part ways. Cole would take command of the host and lead them south to join Ormond Hightower and Prince Darren, but the Prince Regent would not accompany them. Instead, he meant to fight his own war, raining fire on the traitors from the air. Sooner or later, the Queen would send a dragon or two to stop him, and Vagar would destroy them. She dare not send all her dragons, Aemon insisted as that would leave King's Landing naked and vulnerable. Nor would she risk her own dragon, Syrax, or the last of her sweet sons. Rhaenyra might call herself a queen, but she is a woman, and women's hearts are faint, and they have mother's fears. And thus did the Kingmaker and the Kinslayer part, each to their own fate. Whilst at the Red Keep, Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen set about rewarding her friends and inflicting savage punishments on those who had served her half-brother. Sir Luther Largent, commander of the Gold Cloaks, was ennobled. Sir Laurent Maraband was installed as Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard, and charged with finding six worthy knights to serve beside him. Greymaster Orwell was sent to the dungeons, and her grace wrote to the Citadel to inform them that the Lille's servant, Geraldus, 
was henceforth the only true Grand Maester, freed from the same dungeons that swallowed Orwell, the surviving Black Lords and Knights were rewarded with lands, offices and honours. Huge rewards were posted for information leading to the capture of the usurper, styling himself Aegon II, his daughter Jehera, and his son Maelor, the false knight Willis Fell, and Rickard Thorne, and Larry Strong the Clubfoot. When that failed to produce a direct result, Rhaenyra sent forth hunting parties of Knights Inquisitor to seek after the traitors and villains who had escaped her punishment. The Dowager Queen Alicent was fetid at the wrists and ankles with golden chains, though her stepdaughter spared her life for the sake of our father, who once loved you, she told Alicent. Alicent's own father was less fortunate, Sir Otto Hightower, who had served three kings as hand, was the first traitor to be beheaded. Ironrod followed him to the block, still insisting that by law, the king's son must come before his daughter. Sir Tylan Lannister was given to torturers instead, in hopes of recovering some of the crown's treasure. Lord Rosby and Stokeworth, former black lords who had gone green to avoid the dungeons, attempted to turn black again, but the queen declared their faithless friends were worse than foes and ordered their lying tongues removed before their executions. However, their deaths left a nettlesome problem of succession, however, as it happened, each of the faithless friends left a daughter. Rosby's was a maid of twelve, Stokeworth's a girl of six. Prince Damon had proposed that the former be wed hard Hugh, the blacksmith's son, who had taken to calling himself Hugh the Hammer, the latter to off the sot, now simply off white, keeping their lands black, whilst suitably rewarding the dragon seeds for their valour in battle. But situations like this would cause their own problems. Rhaenyra had been very swift to start purging the court of Greens and those loyal to Aegon, but in turn she now had to reward those who had supported her claim with offices and titles, and in some cases these would play a huge role in the events that would soon unfold in King's Landing. <laughs>